going to ask you to do something for me, if you don't mind. How many of you expect to live to be at least 60? Put your hands in the air. At least 70? At least 80? At least 90? Over 100? No optimists in the room. Well, I know over there. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you what's going on in terms of health. I actually have a background in health sciences, and the irony when you study health is that you actually end up thinking a lot about death. But today I want to talk to you about life and how we can actually extend life. Now, if you were lucky enough to have been born in a country with access to regular health care, which is the case, for example, of Western Europe, what we've seen is we've witnessed the doubling, basically, of life expectancy over the last 100 years. So, in fact, we are living longer. Not only are we living longer, but we're living for more years without basically disease-free, which means we're healthier as well. It's become to be known as called basically the longevity riddle, which means it seems like we're postponing aging. We're not only living longer, but better. Why is this happening? Currently, there's, there's actually an interesting debate going on in scientific communities because there was an article in the uh, magazine Nature in 2016, and the scientists proposed that, in fact, humans were limited, meaning there's a cap to how long you can actually live. And the point being was basically that we're, we're not really getting better after the age of 100. So the expectation is that probably that m the max cap in terms of human life is 120, 130. But this ignited a lot of debate on, with other scientists saying, well, no, you can't look at longevity or lifespan or what is the expected age that people or humanity can actually live just based on statistics. So it's not clear if we're really capped, but let's assume that we could live potentially to around 120 and now, if we're only currently sort of reaching 80, so most of you, when you put your hands up, it's reasonably, I mean, logical that you expect to live to more or less 80. What's holding us back? Why are we not getting to be 120, 130? Well, the point is, most probably, sooner or later, you will become a Honda. Now, you're probably thinking about the cars, but that's what I'm talking about. Hondas are hypertensive, obese, non-compliant, diabetic, asthmatic patients. The medical community doesn't love these guys. They actually, we know typically that they whisper amongst themselves, get out of my emergency room, because these diseases are, quite frankly, usually incurable, very complicated to treat, and typically quite frustrating. So, to a certain extent, this is what's sort of not letting us reach the 120, 130 point. Now, can we do something about Hondas? Can we make people live longer? Well, what's happening is actually a lot of advancements in terms of health technology. So what we know is that better science makes for better health. And we've seen what's called the rise of supercentenarians, people who live well past the age of 100 with reasonable level of overall health. Now, what's going on in terms of health tech that is pushing us forward in terms of what can we do to create the second curve of longevity? Can we, is it reasonable for you in this room, especially those of you who are more or less 20, can you actually live? Will we be able to create this potential of 120, 130? So I want to tell you a couple of examples about health tech. The first one is genetics, and this is so cool for me, in my personal opinion. So on the one hand, what's happening is with the Human uh, Genome Project, we were able to map people's individual genetic makeup. So I, we can, in theory, know exactly what's happening in each and every one of you. You all know individually, from a personality point of view, that you are all unique and specific, but your genetics is as well. So today, for example, we can identify if a person has a higher risk level, for example, for heart disease. Now, this would be pretty scary news if I could say, OK, you, you have bigger probability of dying from a heart stroke, for example, if we could do nothing about it. So the second thing that's happening in terms of genetics, which is really amazing, is something that's called molecular scissors. There's a technology that's called CRISPR, Cas9, and what it does is that you can snip out, for example, a mutant gene, replace it with a healthy one. You can take away risk factors and give people information so you can, for example, make that person not become hypertensive. Imagine that we could identify that you, from a genetic point of view, would typically have increased heart disease, 
and we could give you one vaccine that would replace the inflammation, that would lower your cholesterol, which would ultimately lead to the decrease of your over overall risk factor for, in terms of heart. One shot, one injection, done. That's brilliant, isn't it? Remote monitoring is a new, another area in terms of uh, health tech, which is really interesting for chronic diseases. As you've noticed in Hondas, basically we're talking about chronic illnesses. So in this case, basically most people are typically willing to wear some type of tech that will help monitor and, and assess their overall uh, health levels. Now, Imagine a diabetic patient. These people need to know what is their, the level of their blood sugar all the time. Now, instead of getting little pricks and stuff on your fingernails, on your fingers, sorry, imagine the following. You have a really cool tattoo, <laughs> and it's called a digital tattoo. It's being developed, for example, by scientists at MIT. This tattoo tells the person, can monitor and alert them if their blood sugar levels are either too high or too low. It can alert the patient, it can also alert their caregivers or even their healthcare professional, which means that we can more proactively intervene if necessary. So, just-in-time, real-time monitoring of your overall health levels. Regenerative medicine is another thing that's really interesting. Now, I can tell you by experience, I'm not going to tell you my age, but as you grow older, everything gets older, guys. <laughs> Some of them are a lot more visual, meaning your hair. I mean, I find a couple of gray ones every once in a while. The wrinkles, right? If I can offer you one piece of advice, your knees, guys. Take care of your knees. You will need them for a long time. They sort of support your body. Now, which means that sooner or later, you're probably going to want some replacement parts. But guess what? They're not available on Amazon, right? So <laughs> this idea with regenerative medicine and the dreams of the scientists that are working in regenerative medicine is that we could 3D print, for example, new livers, new hearts, new kidneys for patients who need them. This would completely change the outcome of patients, for example, who are on waiting lists for, for, for organs, for example. Now, currently, we are at the level that what we do print are tissues. There's a company that called Organovo, and what they do, for example, is they print blood vessels. But we will certainly come to the point where we can actually 3D print a human replacement organ. That will change completely the paradigm for these patients. Immunotherapy is something that's also super interesting because it's basically unlocking and unleashing the potential of something that already exists in your body. It's your immune system. Today, what we forecast as being the future of cancer treatment is actually cancer immunotherapy. What this means, imagine in your mind that your own personal army, which means your own immune system, can get together a whole bunch of killer cells who will fight off the dreaded C word, which will mean that survival rates in terms of cancer will go from one in four patients that we have right now, forecasted to one in two by 2026, and hopefully three in four. There are some specialists that say, quite frankly, that most of us, as we age and as longevity increases, will probably have two cancers over our lifespan, and it won't be such a complicated thing. It won't be as dreaded. It'll be just one more thing that happens to us, one more thing that probably we're going to add to Honda. So these were some of my examples in terms of health tech and what's happening and how we are, in, in fact, increasing life expectancy. We are basically shifting and flipping the tables on aging, on how we look at health and disease. It used to be that we used to think that actually aging was caused by damage, and today we know that it's actually damage is caused by aging, which means if we can postpone the aging process, if we can solve the longevity riddle, right, we can live longer and we can live healthier for longer amounts of time. This, in part, will be also a shift in how we will care for patients. Today, traditionally, the way we care for patients is what we call, I would call at least, a sick care system. We intervene with patients when they've, once they've been diagnosed, and we already know that they have a problem. Now, imagine flipping this and being able to preempt, preemptively identify risk factors, prevent illnesses, eliminate really nasty things from our bodies so that we can increase our overall level of health and our overall time of life. Now, we've been talking about science, 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 and for sure, science makes for better health. But my last comment to you is the following. Friends and family make for a better life. And this is also science. It was proven by a group of scientists from Brigham Young University. They conducted a meta-analysis over hundreds of different types of research, trying to understand why certain people lived longer than others. 
And what they found was more than stopping drinking, stopping smoking, doing exercise, and even getting a flu vaccine, a flu vaccine apparently is quite important, so do it, uh, <laughs> the one thing that made people live longer were the people who had strong social relationships. So you need friends and family, you need a purpose to live. It's not just about living longer and healthier, it's living with a purpose. You need, for example, for my opinion, a son to love or a family member to love. You need a partner who will follow you on adventures and who will get excited with your own accomplishments. You need a friend who says, buy the shoes, you deserve it, right? That's why we live. So my end point is the secret to longevity, guys, have, of course, take care of your health, sleep well, exercise, get into health tech, but mostly create really, really strong relationships. That's the secret of, of longevity, but mostly that is the essence of humanity. So live long, but live really well. Thanks, guys.